Boy, I wish I'd have flown past this program. No, actually, again, with AEW, unlike the WWE, with the WWE, you know it's going to be boring, but there's going to be almost nothing ridiculous and probably nothing unprofessional. A lot of phony shit, but it'll be shot well. With AEW, you're going to get cable access at, you know, random times. And occasionally, either once or maybe twice, as in this program, there will be two segments that actually do some business and create a positive response and everything else is bleh. And I, I, I've got to be honest starting this program. I don't want anybody to feel like that I'm being a hypocrite or that I've lost my mind, but I'm going to praise Plumber Moxley. I don't know whether he knows what he did or not. Maybe it was accidental. But he did a good fucking promo. A money promo, I'll even say. I had a, a slight issue in the middle. But he comes to the ring, obviously, with what happened last week between him and Punk. People are now like, where is this going? What's happening here? We were all feeling that way. So Mox starts the promo, and they're in Chicago. And I guess they've got Chicago booked. They had Chicago booked Wednesday night. They also did Rampage there. Now they're coming back on Sunday, same building, going to do a pay-per-view, whatever. But as soon as he started talking, I was like, okay, they're trying to fix this. He's turning heel. He's burying punk in Chicago. He's doing a heel promo. This is actually the first coherent, meaningful money promo that this fucking guy I've ever heard him do since I've been watching him. And even a punk folded up and curled up in a ball to die. He just, uh, John Plummer Moxley here was an unsavory, obnoxious, antagonistic fucking asshole in front of these Chicago fans. They got him chanting for punk. And I thought it was almost a little too, I don't know, inside, but when he said the line, he didn't turn out to be what any of us wanted him to be. I understand he's trying to appeal to the fucking brainwashed AEW fans that think that Punk is actually the fucking outlier here and that the rest of the roster is what wrestling's supposed to be. But I think calling Punk fragile and weak, maybe a little strong for the top guy in the company to be called fragile and weak. But with what they were doing later on, I'm going to let this go. And Moxley produces the open contract for a pay-per-view opponent and leaves it in the ring. Whoever signs that contract, the plumber says, I can out everything. I can out fight you. I can out fucking fuck you. I can out run you a foot race, whatever. Then... He, I thought, this is brilliant. In Chicago, especially, they're lucky enough to be there. He has turned heel to give this match some kind of fucking meaning. To give Punk something to come back and conquer. But then he did a babyface close. Where he started putting himself over and the people started cheering him again. Because he wasn't doing it in a heelish way. So there, he had great delivery, but it wasn't good material because... He's backing up on what he's just accomplished. So then I wrote, is he switching heel? Or is he not smart enough to know that the first two-thirds of this promo was him switching heel? <laughs> so we still have questions. And after he's left the ring and the announcers are talking, here comes a steal down to the ring and picks up the contract and walks out with it. And obviously, the majority of people have no idea who the fuck Ace Steel is. In Chicago, it might have been a little, a little better because he's from there. But still, there's a lot of people in the building, and Ace Steel has not been featured on television. But Jim Ross, with one line, was able to throw in conversationally, well, he's awful good friends with Punk. And there you go. So now we know what, and he also, they identified him as one of the backstage producers. 
for whatever the backstage producers do in people's mind. So that is the first time it, that Moxley has ever been palatable to me in any way. And it was a great job of switching heel in front of the people that apparently now we know he's going to have the rematch with against Punk in Punk's hometown. The question is, does he think that he was switching heel just for Chicago, even though they were on television, he was switching heel for everybody, and he almost did a good job of it till the end. But are they going to then ignore this after the the punk match and just have this surly plumber continue to be a babyface after he said those things and told the people of Chicago to piss off? I think that's one of the big questions I had coming out of this was, What's the reaction going to be when they get out of Chicago? Is this all just for Chicago? Because they're going to be there for a while. We have to see, because we do know people like Moxley. I thought the promo, about midway through it, I thought it was the best promo he's done. Because of the energy, he's not in the back, just in front of a, you know, a sewer. He's you know, in the front, yeah. he's in front of fans and some energy. But then at the end, he got to the, you know, I'm going to eat your blood and yeah, I'm going to drink. Blood and break your bones. Yeah, and bone broth out of your blood. Yeah, just whatever he says. It's so stupid. It's, <laughs> it's so stupid and it drags it down because he's believable otherwise. Otherwise, he's that guy you run into in the bar and you don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and then I, I ate his eyeball. Yeah. I'm going to kick your ass. Oh, no. I'm going to fuck you up. Oh, no. And then I'm going to take your blood and I'm going to drink it. And I'm going to wrap your colon around my arm. Like, just... Shut up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, I don't think anyone knew who Ace Steel was. Because I know who he is, but I don't think I've seen him on TV or noticed him before. But that was the good part about it. They a brief, and they didn't belabor it. You know, I mean, the fact that you see him pick the contract up, you know, something's going on. But you didn't know exactly what, and they didn't belabor it till later on. So I, I could get past that. Speaking of getting past things, um, so Tony was in the back with Jericho. Uh, Jericho versus Danielson Sunday. And, Jesus. Anyway, Garcia comes in. You can't have a show without Daniel Garcia. And he does the deal where he recites the dialogue that he has memorized, apologizing to Jericho and offering his support with as much feeling as a comatose zombie who is not really happy to be there and it's it's memorized and stagey interplay about this silliness you know that nobody's gonna buy anyway and nobody cares even if you know the wrestling business is fake phony who cares about this childishness well i'm sorry i didn't i didn't respect you for whatever the fuck and then Jericho closes up with, just remember, Danielson, all's fair in wrestling and romance. Brian, now 99.5% of the people who heard that apparently thinks that Jericho and Brian Danielson are romantically linked because nobody but the most ardent basement dweller or the most ridiculously overprepared wrestling researcher such as you and I remembers that one of the outlaw groups in Japan in the oh, mid 90s come on was called war wrestling and romance because of the weird things that Japanese people are into they got romance in the title of the wrestling company to be fair that was the second name of the company originally not that this is a better name but it was wrestling association r yeah, and then, then they put romance in. And so does anybody know that? Anybody at this point? Well, I mean, like you said, I don't want to completely dismiss it because I know it and I had tapes of it back in the 90s and there are some fans. It's our but fucking business. Other than that, no one knows it. However, what a time to mention it considering they're having a bad trios division. When you think of bad six-man <laughs> matches, you think of wrestling and romance, war in the 90s. That was a thing with them, wasn't it? Ah, so anyway, then Danielson goes to the ring to wrestle Jake Hager. And 
Honestly, as we know, Jake Hager is an awkward bum and has been ever since he fucking debuted. I, I'd never really seen him in the WWF, but I thought, okay, he was there and they used him for a while, so he's going to be okay. And no, he's rotten and he hadn't gotten any better and he never will. But I thought Danielson is so good, he can make Hager look decent, right? An awkward bum. Is what you call an awkward him. bum. He's awkward and he's a bum. He's got that fucking moop face. The moops. That's who it was. The moops. He's got that moop face. Woo. And he stands there at his fucking fashion sense when he's in dress clothes. He looks like a CPA on a golf course. And his wrestling, he doesn't have the timing. He doesn't have the aggression. He doesn't have a higher gear. He's awkward. He's got the size. He's a legitimate shooter. We've seen him do nothing great in the way of professional wrestling. But I figured I'd hope for Danielson. But within two minutes, they're out on the floor, and Hager had spinebustered Danielson through a table just as a spot, and they are on the floor forever. And then... Whenever Hager takes over in a match and he's controlling somewhat the tempo, even if the other more experienced guy is calling it, shit slows down. You keep waiting for him to be impressive or good, and he never is. And it's there. And finally, Danielson made a comeback. The people are with him like fucking crazy. Brian Danielson... Maybe a, a Punk is more over, I think, over. Danielson, I think, is more beloved and popular with those people. So the people are with him on the comeback, and he kept going for an arm bar, a label lock, or whatever the fuck, and they did a little back and forth, and finally, Danielson hits the knee. Boom, one, two, three. Right finish, right result. But then here come the heels in. They've got to get heat. Quotation marks, I say heat again, as every time, every match is over, there's got to be an afterbirth. So now the heels jump on him. Why? And then here comes Claudio and Utah to make the same. At this point, why don't they just come down to begin with? Because everybody knows they're coming. I mean, this is the most ridiculous run-in company I've ever seen, and I've seen companies bad on run-ins. In the territory days, the uh, guys used to tell me, you know how you can tell when the company's doing too many run-ins. When there's a fucking big post-match angle going on in the ring and the bell's ringing and shit's flying and people are getting shit kicked out of them. The fans aren't watching the ring. The fans have turned their head to the locker room entrance to, to see who's coming out. That means you've done too many run-ins. I can imagine that these people have their heads toward the back. So... Claudio and Wheeler Useless jump in on the other Jericho appreciators and they fight off. They actually fight to the back, through the back entranceway. They fight completely out of the arena so Jericho can come to the ring with a chair and draw back and he's going to smite Danielson, but Garcia comes from behind Jericho and grabs the chair away from him. Now, Garcia has just apologized earlier for interfering with Jericho and doubting him and blah, blah, blah. Now he's back to doing that. And then Danielson hits Jericho with the knee while he's disrupted by Garcia. Your thoughts on this contest? It was all right when Danielson was doing stuff with the crowd behind him, but Hager is just death on TV. No one wants to see him. Even if he's against Danielson, in my case... And then you said it, the run-ins. Let's just go to the bigger issue, this feud. The Jericho Appreciation Society <laughs> feuding with the Blackpool Combat Club, or at least certain members of the Combat Club. I don't know where Steve Regal is. He's supposed to be the manager. He's never there. Well, that's because he's on color. Because they, they have to have him on color um, to make a four-man announce booth because they don't have enough announcers. I'm not saying Regal shouldn't do color, but... Drop somebody out of the... Anyway. They got to get Danielson away from all this. He was on a trajectory. They took him completely off it. Just put him on another trajectory. End this Jericho thing. Let him beat Jericho at the pay-per-view. And then everyone move on. Him and 
Daniel Garcia could hug. Maybe he could adopt him, bring him into his home, and we could all move on. Speaking of moving on, we moved on on this television program. (laughs) The wingmen were in the ring. The wingmen are composed of Ryan Nemeth, who's Dolph Ziggler's younger brother, and I like him. He's got some oomph to him. He's an entertaining fellow. We never see him on television in this company. He's always on YouTube, along with his cohorts, Peter Avalon, who's potentially one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen in a ring and should be immediately shot on sight by any Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, well-meaning people. If you see this guy out in public, just shoot him on sight. Uh, Cesar Romero. Hypothetically or or, uh, figuratively, you mean? No, well, okay, just take a baseball bat and bash his head in. Turn his brains into jelly. He's a menace to society. Jesus Christ. Uh, Cesar Romero is back. Old Cesar and J.D. Drake, they are the wingmen, apparently. And they were in the ring picketing with posters because they deserved more TV time. And they'd been in the ring 45 seconds when music plays, and here comes W. Morrissey. Why is his first name W? Uh, So they don't get sued by the singer Morrissey from the Smiths. What was his first name? Well, he didn't reveal that. He just called himself Morrissey. Well, then why can't this guy be like Bill Morrissey or George Morrissey or Jim Morrissey or any Morrissey? Why does he have to be W. Morrissey? What is that all about? He looks like a seven-foot Greg Allman. Couldn't he be fucking Allman Morrissey? What would the gimmick be, that he's the illegitimate child of Greg Allman? He's the illegitimate child of, of Greg Allman and Cher, but we think that she fucked Wilt Chamberlain the same week. <laughs> oh, the sperm got mixed. <laughs> that doesn't even make any sense. Yes, then why it would does. he be blonde? Then tall. why would he be blonde? Because Greg's jizz was in there. It was a mixture of the jizz. I don't know why I'm engaging took, you in this. She took, she took a bath in a jizz jacuzzi. A jizz koozie, and she got the illegitimate son of Greg Allman and Wilt Chamberlain. Okay, so let me ask you this. Who's explaining this on commentary? Is this Excalibur or Jim Ross? I'll do it. Really? I'll do it. <laughs> Sign up for that, okay. If they'll give him that gimmick, I'll I'll take a job there just to be able to explain it. The jizz koozie. So this fucking guy, and remember, he was on the show once before, and he's rotten. He's rotten. And all he is is another guy that's going to make other giant guys look small because that's what he's got. He's big. And he comes at, walks to the ring, and the heels just one at a time or two at a time, in one's case, because that's what the spot called for, just run at him leaving themselves open for the big bump that he's going to give them. They walk right into the shit. Uh, That Peter Avalon was especially phony and silly and fucking fake. And he's another guy that I would have fucking grabbed by the collar or the hair of the head and see the pants or something and physically thrown him out of a building I was in charge of for putting on an exhibition like that in a wrestling ring. Piece of shit. Uh, There was no life or reason to any of this. They just, they took their requisite bumps from this fucking guy and Stokely then comes in and he's handing out this card. There are escort services in major American cities that have more private phone numbers than old Stokely Carmichael here. Hathaway. Hathaway. Well, you, you Hathaway or I'll Hathaway, one or the other. And again, then Tony is there and Tony asks, Old Stokely about the cards and Stokely turns away like it's Nunya. And Tony says, no, wait a minute. This is our job. We're supposed to find out about these things. And Stokely, all five foot four of him, who has been (laughs) so far a reserved kind of fella, because Tony says, no, no, tell me what the cards are about. He snatches Tony up by the lapels. And then obviously, and Tony says, you jack off. (laughs) JR says, that's a fine. They've just had the fucking (laughs) language meeting. 
So Tony calls the manager a jack off because the manager, for no reason whatsoever, snatches the announcer up by the suit jacket. And then Tony is scared of the seven foot Greg Allman standing there. So he backs off and, and the heels leave. Uh, again, why is W. Morrissey, first of all, why is his name W? Secondly, why was he there and we didn't hear anything about it until his music plays and he wanders out to accost four job guys that we've never seen on TV before because they're always on YouTube? And then they have a stagey situation where they take contrived bumps for this guy, obviously cooperating with it. One of them acts especially comedic to try to draw attention to himself because apparently his fucking cousin Nancy was watching back home on TV. And then the manager gets violent with the announcer when he tries to find out who this new star is. What the fuck? You got a seven-foot guy. Okay. We're going to fucking billboard him. We're going to talk about him. He's coming. He's going to be a force when he gets here. We're going to hear him talk. We're going to see footage of him in action in other places, laying waste to people. Finally, next week, he's going to be here live. Holy shit, what's going to happen? No, let's just play some generic music, bring the fucking guy out. Well, that's W. Morrissey, who's been here once, ever. Fucking shit. You jack off. Poor Tony. I bet he had to pay that fine, too. Poor Tony. What's he doing out there? So what do you think of William Morris and his agency? He wishes, first of all, that that's who he was related to. You know, when the wingman first came out, I was like, okay, who's coming out? Is it Wardlow? Is it FTR? Is it whoever it is? Who's coming out to get a little bit of time chasing off guys we never see on TV? My second thought was, oh, man, Peter Avalon still works there? I thought he got released. And then W. Morrissey comes out. Now I have to call him this. You know, I was kind of ready to shit on it until the Stokely Hathaway entrance. And hear me out for a second. We have no idea where this thing's going. He has approached, successfully so far, I think, Ethan Page, the Gun Brothers, if that's what we call them, W. Morrissey, I'm forgetting someone. Who's the other one? Lee, is it Lee Johnson or Lee Moriarty? I don't know. I don't even remember. But there's a Lee. He's got a Lee. <laughs> we don't know where this is going. And I agree it was ridiculous that all of a sudden he got physical with Shivani, that Shivani just no-sold it completely. <laughs> but we did say that we'd like to see this guy be a little bit more serious. Now, if AEW did something more serious in the right direction, it would be a shock. You think they, meant, they thought that was serious? I think, I think so. I think there has been a little bit of a change in the tone in how he's been presented. It's been mild, but we haven't really seen him telling jokes with Jade for a little bit. <clears throat> and now he's doing this. Oh, we forgot about old Jane. Jane's in there too in the group. No, I don't think she's part of the... She doesn't well, have... Well, a... you, you never see her in the group, but she's affiliated with Stokely and she's now... And he's giving his card out everywhere. He's just playing every set. The whole point is, if you're going to have a manager, look here. God damn it. Yes, he's been on television because he was in NXT, but it's not like being a manager in NXT meant you were managing Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar and the biggest stars in the fucking world. He, he didn't have the pedigree of Paul Heyman. So, when you've got a manager that is not over to the level of Paul Heyman in the WWE right now where Bobby Heenan was in his day or in the AWA or I wasn't in or whatever the case. When you have a manager that's not noted for managing top talent or being affiliated with the champions or the very upper echelon guys, you have to give him one of those guys when you first introduce him or elsewise the manager does not get over because an unknown manager can't get over with underneath or middle card talent. Then you've pigeonholed the manager in the middle. If a 
unknown manager comes in and is immediately paired with a main event talent, that tells the fans that that manager is somebody important and somebody to be fucking taken into account. And then you book things along in that direction. You can get an unknown wrestler over with a main event manager, a la Bobby Heenan bringing in anybody. And they're over because they're a member of the Heenan family. But you can't do it in reverse because that does not translate. So, you know, it, it, and then they've split this again. I understand if you didn't want the package to just be Stokely and Jane Cargill because Jane's not out there every fucking week and they've still not. I mean, you can't expect Miracle. She's not going to have 20 minute matches. She's still green. But when they send him out, okay, the guns and then fucking the other page where he's been floating and meaningless. And is he hurt? Cause he never wrestles anymore. And then he's coming out and giving this other guy a card. And now he brings out that, well, now it's just all over the fucking place and there's no focus. And do we, are we expected to believe that W Morrissey is a main event guy because he beat up four job guys that we've never seen before? Or are we expect to believe that W. Morrissey's a main event guy because the manager that gives his card to all the underneath talent has now given his card to W. Morrissey. And W. Morrissey... That is the worst name. You're right. Besides the fact that that is the worst name in history, <laughs> he's been working out. He used to look a little soft, as they say fleshy now he's been working out he's got a nice little physique there and he and he's gonna have a goddamn stroke flexing so hard because he's one of these guys that thinks if you flex and make a mean face and scream till your face turns red that that will get into the camera that that will get you over to the audience at home so that's what he was doing every time he'd give somebody a bump he'd turn and flex and turn red and no, from I, we saw him longer the last time he had a match here, which was against who the fuck was it? It was was it Wardlow? It was somebody that Something. was beating people every week. Maybe Wardlow. Yeah, and he didn't look that good, as I recall, because I said I don't think he looks that good. So he's a guy that is deceptive. He's like a Mark Jendrak. He's just big enough and tall enough that he makes the real top talent that are big look smaller and makes the top talent that are smaller look even smaller than they already are. How do and you... that's, I, I'm I'm sorry, I, I predict his future will be very, very dim in AEW because he doesn't know how to take care of himself, and I don't know that anybody's going to be motivated to teach him. Go ahead, your thoughts. How do you approach someone like that for an autograph? Do you say, excuse me, W, uh, man, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're supposed to say. That's Mr. Morrissey to you. Mr. Morrissey. That'd be better than W. Morrissey. Mr. Morrissey. Like well, I said, I'm just curious how they're using Stokely Hathaway because we know he could talk, he could be silly, but he could just be funny enough. He's now shown that he could be menacing to 60-something-year-old announcers. I kind of want to see where they're going with that. And But again, you don't, you don't snatch your announcers unless it's an angle. Now they've established that anybody can just snatch the fucking announcer and it doesn't mean anything. They will not save anything for when it might mean something with somebody meaningful. Huh. It, it, it should have been in a production meeting or something if somebody suggested to Vince McMahon, well, let's snatch Michael Cole or let's snatch Jim Ross. And then later yeah, on, they ended things, up... Yeah, things changed after you left. Yeah, him. <laughs> things changed, and they ended up snatching Michael Cole and Jim Ross and putting them in the ring, and it was some of the most horrid programming in history. But when <laughs> Vince is, still was in control of his faculties, no. You'd say, well, that'll happen as a lead-up to WrestleMania. Wasn't Michael All Cole right. sexually assaulted by, what was his name, Heidenreich? Oh, Big Bad John. Yes, I think he did take him in the shower for a Johnny Valentine treatment. And they filmed like this, <laughs> whatever. It was like an episode of Oz all of a sudden on <laughs> WWE. Big Bad John. John Heidenreich was a hell of a guy. They could have got some fucking money out of him, too, or made some money off of him, but 
Anyway. The answer to who is the worst road warrior? Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, coming up next, guess who was back? A name that we have not seen in so long, and people were just clamoring to find out when he was going to come back. Officer Bar Brady was back doing... <laughs> you think Tony Schiavone said, hey, I'm doing everything at the desk, plus all these pre-taped backstage promos where people think I have to run back and forth to the back every five minutes and I must be a goddamn teleporter. Uh, let Barb Brady do one of them. So he's back, and he was with Will Ostrich. And immediately Don Callis came in with these smarmy heel compliments, backhanded, of course, and tonight's going to be so exciting. And boy, little did Callis know that he was speaking for all of us when he said, tonight will be so exciting. Did you watch Hikaru Shida and Tony Storm against Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker? I watched a good amount of it, yeah. <laughs> well, at first I say, you know, I'm running short on time. Want to make sure I'm not late doing the broadcast, but then it had been transpiring for a minute or so. Did you see Shida give Hayter the leaping Hurricane Rana? I actually missed that. I must have walked away at that moment. Okay. Sheeta hits the ropes. There's Hater in the middle of the ring. Sheeta leaps, running back toward Hater, leaps up, legs around her head, gives her the running Hurricane Rana, and God damn it, just propelled poor Jamie Hater straight to the mat, face first, like a goddamn, she'd been shot out of a cannon. And knocked the poor girl goofy. You could tell. The referee immediately went down to check on her. And Sheeta jumps up and fires up the people. She's completely oblivious that she nearly bashed this girl's face in. She thinks she took the bump normally and everything was fine, right? When, even though all the people went, oh, like that. So then she tags Storm in. And Storm comes in and takes over on the poor girl who apparently was still conscious, and they went on. At that point, I'd seen enough. And what happened? Anything else interesting? The only other interesting thing I'll say, and the women's division has been a mess for a while, but they really react to Britt Baker because she's got a personality that goes past the division. Right. Hater, I've said it before, Hater may be the best in-ring female, other than like a Serena Deeb, Hater may be the best in ring in the entire company. The fans didn't react to Sheeta, which is which is kind of telling, I think. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people see these women's segments as a chance to go into the kitchen, check on the kids, whatever it may be, and uh, have a root canal. It's not fair. Give give yourself a high colonic. It's not fair, but you know, if you've given women's wrestling a chance in AEW, the way it's booked on TV and just it's like the men's division in a sense, like someone gets over, someone's being used, the fans are reacting, then you don't see them for a little while. So I, it was all right for what it was. Ruby Soho was going to save that division, wasn't she? And look at how she was booked. Where, where is she at? Where has she been? Is she still there? She's still there. She's, uh, she was teaming up, uh, I guess it was the Friday show. Couldn't be the pay-per-view. It was her and Ortiz against... Sammy and Ty Conti, because obviously... What, what was the ratings on last Friday's Rampage episode? Oh, hold on. Am I doing two things and you got me looking up fucking ratings? Well, hold now on. you'll do three things. Rampage TV ratings. Yeah. I because remember, the... earlier in this program, we established that at various points in the history of wrestling in Memphis, Tennessee, the television program aired over the air on broadcast television by Channel 5 in and around the Memphis area within 100 miles of Memphis was doing 300,000 viewers each week just on that one station in and around Memphis, Tennessee. What is the amount of people viewing the Friday night AEW program on national cable on TBS in the entire fucking country. The most recent rating, which is a week ago at today as we are recording, for August 26, 2022, 431,000 viewers. 
Well, there you go. They got an extra 130000 over what Memphis TV used to. Oh, I forgot. Memphis would then also be broadcast in Louisville, Kentucky, and also in Lexington, Nashville, and Evansville, Indiana. So that's immediately much more than 130,000 people. So a television program that aired on five local stations had more viewers than theirs in the entire fucking United States of America. That's interesting. Let's continue on. They're actually doing a package now and promoting the angle where young Pip Sabian, the Charles Dickens-like urchin who has been wearing a box on his head and sitting at ringside for the past year, tormenting Pac, apparently on Tony Khan's dime. This is the wrestling assignment that this guy's had for a year or so, is sit in the crowd and wear a box on his head. He has excelled at it much better than anything he ever did in the ring. So he was doing the voiceover of this. Did he speak as prissily before uh, when he was young Pip Sabian with the virgin Penelope Swale and, uh, you know, the, the, the whole Miro thing when they were doing the video game gimmick? Did he speak like that? Or is he now he because apparently in the last year, Old young Pip has uh, spent the night in a haunted house because it turned his hair gray. Remember, he used to be a little shriveled up version of Johnny Sameface, but now he's got gray hair. I think he's encountered a horrible fright. I don't think there's any comparison to Johnny Gargano. He's a lot taller than Johnny Gargano, I think, but... You know... Wait a minute. Little Pip is taller than Gargano? I'll bet you he's taller than Gargano. Absolutely. Little Pip. I think we joke. Little Pip ab- squeak. I we joke about guys who are like Disney Channel villains, Nickelodeon villains. That's what this, this was, was. One of me. Yeah. Pip Sabian should be out after some Dalmatians. <laughs> That's right. All right. So, and then of course the the counterpoint. His old, uh, his old friend Miro was doing a promo in his dark room, where they've got him in. They never pay the light bill. They're on television, but everybody wants to be shot in the dark. Uh, And then Darby Allen walked in there with him. Darby is still speaking like he's cruising on Lake Havasoma. No emotion, no oomph in it. Just, just, uh, yeah, man. I guess, I don't know whether it's that's the way he memorizes it or that one of these stunts that he does has given him brain damage and he has no inflection left in his voice. And then here came Sting in. Somebody pay the electric bill. They're all in the dark. And when Sting walked in, then he obliterated the sight of Miro because they they only had the little bitty spots, you know, spotlights fucking pointed. So he shaded Miro. They're doing something. I don't know what. Any closing thoughts on any of those segments before we get to the second good segment on and last good segment on this program you know i wondered what they were going to do with miro on the pay-per-view i wondered what they were going to do with darby i don't know why i didn't just go with the obvious another fucking six-man match but (laughs) we'll see what happens at the pay-per-view and then like mussolini saving the booking giving it the best try he can here comes punk And he enters subdued, his hands in his pockets. If you notice, he is always out with the appropriate emotion. If he's happy to be there or should be happy to be there, then he's happy. If he's wrestling, then he's got his game face on, but he's confident. If something like this has happened, he comes out, you can almost see the tears in his eyes. And that's something that used to be standard in wrestling and is no longer even thought about which is why bianca belair you can burn her house down the next day she's going to come out on tv skipping and smiling twirling her hair so he did the promo and he started talking about the damage to his foot three plates 16 screws i have a feeling that he didn't make that up so apparently this was worse than we thought it might be And one smartass started to chant Cold Cabana. 
Actually, that's usually the Colt Cabana chants usually consist of one smart ass, but could you hear as, it at home on TV? You heard it? Actually, I had to go back and replay it because as soon as Punk pointed at the guy and, and said what he said, which I'm about to mention, that's I said, what was that? And then you can you can hear if you're listening for it. Because it was it bled over somebody's microphone, but right. it was a very faint cold cold. But Punk heard it because the guy was in the front row. He had just talked about his three plates and 16 screws. The guy goes, Colt Cabana. And Punk immediately says, which, by the way, is 16 times more than this fat guy's got screwed in his life and gets a big pop from the people. And then he explained he probably came back too early. And he just got beat up in Cleveland. And he doesn't know if his new 100% is good enough. But he came back to wrestling because he loves the business and the fans, and it hurts to feel like I let you down. This is great stuff. This is the baby face. This is the hero actually being conflicted on whether he should return or not and whether he'll be good enough, but not like really like some fucking mental incompetence. Oh, my God. No, this is out in front of the people so they'll know that he supposedly feels this way so it will play into the story god damn it i can't believe i have to say these things at this point and then he breaks down maybe he's not good enough anymore this is classic shit if he really felt that way and wanted to fucking quit then i'd say he's goddamn nuts but for the story it's brilliant. And then here comes a steal out. And he again identifies himself in a conversational way. And they refer to what happened earlier just briefly. And he gives Punk the pep talk, the Rocky and Mickey speech, the corner man. This is classic psychology. He is Punk's old mentor, his old trainer. And legitimately, Ace came first. He was already established in the in the Chicago area in the 90s. And he gets him fired up, and then he slaps him. And he says, you fucking get up. He got carried away, and he fucking said fucking after they'd had the meeting. And this was reported on the internet immediately when he went through the curtain he held his hand up and said it's my fault i slipped he fined himself i think or paid whatever fine tony khan wanted him to fucking pay but it worked here he was firing punk up you're better than this you can do it get up it's not how many times you get knocked down it's how many times you get up you fucking get up sign this contract and the fans were screaming and he says, have you forgot who you were? And the fans chant CM Punk, CM Punk. And now Punk cuts the fired up promo. He's been convinced. He's seen the light. He starts firing him up. He goes into the crowd. He goes out in the audience. He rouses Chi-Town behind him. He runs for the mayor of Chicago. You can't break my bones or drink my blood, Moxley, because we are Chicago. And he signs the contract in the middle of the people. Brian, did you see? They literally did throw a baby in the air. Well, they raised him up, at least. They, they didn't raised let go him of him. Yeah. But they raised him up. They offered up a baby to the god of CM Punk in Chicago. Don't throw your babies, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Don't throw the baby or kick the baby. But no, and, and everybody tweeted that picture of the guy holding the baby up. The babies are in the air in Chicago. This was fucking perfect. I didn't see it coming. And I realize now how much sense it makes. If they'd have had this match, two baby faces one a phony champion interim champion the other the real champion moxley had not been on a reign of terror moxley had not 
taken advantage of anybody in Punk's absence or done anything that needed to be gotten even with. They had to do something or it was just going to be a blasé fucking baby face match for fucking marks of goddamn wrestling moves. And there's a a lot fewer of those than ever before. They needed to have some emotion in this. There needed to be a heel and a baby face. And now, at least in Chicago, there's going to be a heel and a baby face because Moxley is shit on the town at the same time as Punk just ran for mayor and was offered up babies as sacrifices. So now we got something. Now there's going to be a fucking atmosphere. Now maybe people might buy the pay-per-view to see what's going to happen. Do you think Moxley will threaten to either eat the baby or drink the baby's blood? I think the, I know. I think he's going to grind the baby's bones to make his bread. Um, this is the first time I've ever heard Ace Steel do a promo to the best of my knowledge. And he was fantastic. He well, nailed the tone that it had to be. And the look on Punk's face after he got the slap, you mentioned how Punk comes out there. He always has the right look on his face. I remember someone years ago saying, David Bowie's amazing. He's always in the perfect pitch. And CM Punk comes out there, his face tells the story, but you don't know what the whole story is. And then it all unfolds. So uh, again, this this segment and the previous segment, the the first one with Moxley, this sold this cold-ass fucking blasé match. And since all of a sudden the entire direction, complexion, and inflection of this thing changed as soon as Punk showed back up. I have a feeling we know that is this was not a Booker of the Year fucking uh, inspiration. Anyway, moving quickly through the rest of the program, because it's all downhill from here, folks, the sit-down with Jim Ross with Jungle Boy and Christian Cage. They keep trying to remake the magic of the Mick Foley Mankind sit-down with Jim Ross and and Jr. can't do it alone. Dramatic music behind it. Christian Cage is well spoken. He's convincing. Jungle Boy's voice sounds like a whiny teenager with no emotion. He's trying to act. And even when he talks about his dad who's passed away, he can't muster up some goddamn balls in his voice. My father taught me to be a man, and that is a lesson I'm going to teach to you with no contractions. You know who you can't trust, Brian? Who's that? You can't trust a motherfucker that doesn't use contractions when they speak. I will say that again a different way. You cannot trust a motherfucker who does not use contractions when they speak. See? You can't trust that. But you can trust a motherfucker that uses some contractions when they're fucking talking because it's natural. So this guy's either an English professor in his spare time or elsewise he's reciting memorized lines. So does anybody care to see Jungle Boy against Christian Cage at this point? I think less people care than they did a few weeks ago. Now, with yeah. that said, people will react to it because it's at the big event in Chicago. Those fans will be all amped up for it. But he should have never been on the mic. He should have never been doing promos because from day one, the first time we heard him talk, he's been bad and it's gotten worse, not better. This segment did nothing to make anyone want to see this match. He's horrible on the mic. And you would almost think he would need a gimmick that'd be perfect to not have to talk on the mic. Like he's a jungle boy with no idea how to speak. But even if you didn't want to use that and you wanted to make it real, just don't let he him need, talk. He needs a manager named Baloo. Um, then we have an entrance for a six man tag team match. FTR gets their entrance. Then Wardlow gets the long walk. The two most over individual or over entities, one tag team and one single that from about six or eight weeks ago in this company have now been reduced to meaningless six man tags against jobbers. When there's actually other six-man tags on the program for a, a an alleged six-man tag team championship. So now they have to put these guys in the same kind of matches as them and make sure that these guys have dweebs to work with and no time to do it 
so that they so FTR and Wardlow beat three job guys in a minute. For no reason. There's no reason they should be a six-man tag team. There's no reason they should be interacting. And then right after that, Moxley walks out to the ring and kicks Justin Roberts out of the ring and accepts the signed contract that Punk already signed. And it, this was the law of diminishing returns with Moxley. He comes out, and basically he could have said, if that's what your boy wants, then that's what he'll get, Chicago. I'll be here. But instead, this is where he tried to go on about the drinking of the blood and the cracking of the bones. And the law of diminishing returns kicks in. There's no way he's going to be lucky enough to do this right twice in a row, especially on the same program. And he fucking finally gets to a point where he stops for a second. Did you see they hit his music and he starts trying to talk again and realize his music is playing and gets mad? and throws the $2,500 wireless microphone out of the fucking ring like a goddamn baseball. But at least it was short because they cut him off and he accepted. But you can't get two good ones out of Moxley in the same show. Speaking of not good interviews, Pizzeria Uno in the back with Tony Schiavone and another one of the masked dork order jobbers Andre Oleolio comes in and tries to buy the masked guy. And again, what the fuck are they doing? Is Andre going to be out of there soon? It's every Andrade segment is just bizarre. He's in the stairwell making deals that no one cares about, what wrestlers no one cares about. He's in the locker room. No one cares. Stacy had come in the TV room at this point, and she has never seen Pizzeria Uno, to my knowledge, or to her knowledge. She said, who the fuck is that guy? She said, look, is he's both fat and pale and dressed in pleather with that shark mask. What is the fucking deal? I said, he's one of the dork order. He's the leader of the dork order. And we get another... Example here that his voice sounds like a 13-year-old girl. And he's trying to bow up to Andre, who at least looks like a goddamn athlete. And Andre grabs the other jobber's crutch and beats up Uno with his own partner's crutch. While Jose, the assistant, threatens the masked job dork order guy that's got the bad knee with a stun gun. He didn't hit it with him, but he just zapped it toward him, and the guy just sat there and let the other guy beat up his fucking partner with a crutch. What was happening here? <laughs> Again, I believe the last time we saw Andrade, it was him and Roosh ripping the mask off another wrestler. We never heard of that wrestler again. We never found out what happened with that. And that was Why has the assistant got a stun gun? Who did he want to buy previously? He wanted to buy Darby, right? Wasn't he trying he to, buy to buy Darby, Darby from, Sting? from Sting? Yeah. They never even had a match, did they? I don't know. If they did, it doesn't register, which tells the story. Even if they did, it doesn't register. So coming out of that promo, Rush and Felix teamed up against Dante Martin and Wheeler Useless. And gymnastics class was in session. And I was starting to hit the fast forward. But Stacy's reactions, I wrote down some of them. What the fuck? They're going to kill somebody. Who the fuck said I'll take that? Why the fuck would you do that? What the fuck are they doing? <laughs> I know Stace has never been a an in-ring worker that you would say, okay, you know, she's in comparison with Mildred Burke and June Byers, right? But she spent quite a bit of time in the premier developmental program in the wrestling business. And that means she's seen trained people. She's seen people trained. She's seen trained talent exhibit their training. And she's got a pretty discerning eye for stupid shit 
You should have seen her reaction. Another one of these goofy dipshits gave somebody the reverse Hurricane Rana. What do they call it? The Poison Rana, where they go backward and land on. I think it was Felix took it, landing on it. She said, who the fuck said, oh, I'll take that. It's, you know, when, it, this is kind of what it would be like if you had somebody that was in the wrestling business 20 years ago, and then they just were in a medically induced coma for 20 years and quit watching it because she has paid very little attention. And then now she tries to pick it up. And it's like, this is not even, this is not the same endeavor, the same line of work. These people have all lost their fucking minds. It would be the same with anybody else. If you broke somebody out of an iceberg that had been in the wrestling business 20 years ago and hadn't seen shit. So this match was a goddamn clusterfuck of epic proportions, and it then it was over. Did I miss anything? Not for your sensibilities, no, no, no. Okay. Then they had more of the dork order jobbers in the back. This was little Brutus and the other guy that doesn't wear a mask, and they're crying about Friday in the six-man tag tournament their partner apparently was the mass job guy that was on crutches and his knees bad. And now apparently Pizzeria Uno is injured as well because he got the shit beat out of him with a crutch <laughs> and that the partner furnished and then didn't help save him. And they're upset they don't have a partner. They're going to have to fight the other fucking idiots by themselves two against three or whatever and here comes adam page in and offers to be their partner and not only did they accept and then they went to the graphic and actually stacy again pointed this out this was where she got up off the couch and walked out of the room she couldn't take anymore page walks in out of nowhere offers to be their partner because they need one they say okay the announcer says, we'll be right back. They go to a graphic that's already prepared <laughs> on this live television program of the match on Friday with Paige as partner. But even funnier than that, old hangnail Adam Page came out and did a live interview, which he's not real good at anyway, under the best of circumstances, and ran his fucking dick liquor about CM Punk and ends up, as a result of that, two weeks later, teaming up with job guys on the lowest-rated wrestling program on television. Maybe he should have kept his fucking mouth shut, and as Mama Cornette used to say, sat his little white ass in the corner and kept his mouth shut and his ears open and learned something. Instead of going out and causing himself to be known a fucking idiot by refusing to keep his mouth shut becoming known as unprofessional which is even worse but he's gonna get what he wants out of this right they're gonna have the dark order against kenny omega and the young bucks in the finals at the pay-per-view and here's another thing so we get more of the fun drama between page and his, the friends who don't like him drinking and the other friend who drove him <laughs> to drink and whatever the fuck this is we are expected to believe that the hardly boys and Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang against the Dork Order and Hangnail Page on pay-per-view would be a better match, bigger money-drawn proposition than FTR Bucks 3 for all the belts. That's what they're having. Well, I got news for you. When you tell me bullshit, you asshole little whiny motherfuckers, I will say bullshit because I'm not just going to nod and say, oh, that's great. Like all the people that have to put up with your ass do. Hey, Kenny can't so take us can out of a video game. Yeah, you can't take me out of the video game. Can't let my contract expire. So I'm going to tell you, you whiny little dick lickers, your shit don't fool me. And it doesn't fool a lot of other people either. Even though the simple-minded little fucking trampoline fans that you've got that like all your flips and all your bullshit can't see through you because they're not smart enough we can we know exactly what you're doing and we're going to mention it every fucking week because you care more about whether you and your friends get to play than whether this mark billionaire ever gets a return on his fucking investment 
And speaking of which, we come to the main event of this program. Will Ostrich and Ozzy Oldham against the Hardly Boys and Harpo. And again, it's exactly what you would expect. Ostrich and Harpo start off, act like a video game, then they all do an extended 100-mile-an-hour six-way in front of the referee. Nothing makes sense. They all fight in the arena. Then they get back in the ring. Then they do some illogical nonsense. Nobody can figure out who the babyface and heels are. There's no flow to the match. Meaningless moves, one after the other. Stupid flips and dives. It looks like a video of Cirque du Soleil. The referee is completely buried. Nobody sells shit. Everybody's basics look completely shit and phony. Everybody kicks out of a bunch of ridiculous shit. And then they finish up right before they're supposed to go off the air. But this one right here may have been the worst and phoniest wrestling match I've ever seen on AEW television because everybody was trying to outdo the other one on how many cheerleading routines they could do, making the human pyramid, boosting a guy up so he can hang off another guy's neck and be twirled around three times so that the partners can throw other partners into the opponent's moves, blah, 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 blah. And then it becomes over suddenly for some reason. Was that pretty much blow by blow what happened here for 30 fucking minutes? It went on a long time. And, you know, if you're into these guys and you're into this stuff, and Osprey's talented, and that one guy in Aussie Open's got some good size to him, then it's all right. But like you said, they kick out of everything. Hey, the, the they guy take in forever Aussie to Oldham, set up their moves. The guy in Aussie Oldham has the size. He'd be wonderful to be on the bottom of the pyramid pitching the smaller cheerleaders up in the air. And Ostrich is a very talented son of a gun. I would say that he should walk onto America's Got Talent with his well, gymnastics routine next week. He's British. They have British people on America's Got Talent. He's in America. That means America's got him. And until he gets kicked out, which could happen any time. <laughs> That's not how it works. He's qualified to go on, and he should go on and do his gymnastics and his tumbling. And they'd get a rounds of applause from me. It's only that they're fucking embarrassing when they get in a wrestling ring and try to have a wrestling match doing that shit. That's when I take offense. Because I got news for you, Ostrich. You ain't any more of a fucking wrestler than Twinkle Toes. Whether you guys like each other or really do hate each other, whether you're working a gimmick or he, you really can't stand him, I can identify with that if you can't. He is an insufferable fucking douchebag, but you're pretty much a fucking twat yourself with your goddamn eggplant hair. You look like a goddamn the ass end of a fucking northbound fucking mule. Um, Where did this come from? Well, it just, I'm just listening to these insufferable, whiny voiced little fucking douchebags, these giant vaginas knocking each other and twitting back and forth each other. And either one, they don't have a point because both of them suck for the same reasons in the same way. It's not professional wrestling. You're very talented acrobats. Go flip around on somebody else's dick. Stay out of my fucking business. I can't stand to watch either one of them because it's fucking ludicrous. And if if you were to, even though they look like they're in good shape and they have nice physiques, they're the most unintimidating pricks I've ever seen. Even if they are able to knock somebody out, you wouldn't think it by the childish things they argue about and the fucking feminine manner in which they skip around the ring doing their goddamn round-offs and cartwheels and handsprings and various things of that nature. And then they get their panties in a bunch because somebody insults them and hurts their fucking feelings. So fuck Ostrich and Harpo. They're two sides of the same fucking coin. All right, well, unfortunately, due to restrictions, that won't be the name of this episode. Fuck Ostrich and Harpo, but I wish it was. Can, can they? Can the episode be two sides of the same fucking coin? Yeah, that ain't gonna work either. And won't work either. We're we're under TBS rules now. Oh well, in that case, I'm, give, I'm, give me some money. <laughs> I, I gotta I gotta find myself.
Uh, all righty then. But that's this week. Now we got the big shows this weekend to look oh, forward to. What a weekend. And I got to watch Bleacher Report and The Cock because I have Spectrum, by the way, did I mention, ladies and gentlemen, they still haven't fixed whatever it is. Whenever I try to order a pay-per-view, a screen pops up that says I'm supposed to call a local phone number after 6 o'clock on Sunday, the night of the fucking event that starts at 7, and then they'll redirect me back to that. So basically none of these wrestling promotions are getting any more of my fucking pay-per-view money because Spectrum can't get their shit together enough to sell me one. And Spectrum ain't getting any of this pay-per-view cut either because they can't get their shit together enough to sell me one. So I'm going to have to do the streaming TV thing, which I fucking despise because there's no on-screen fucking search to get by some of this drismal fucking dreck, as well as the fact that I can't use my cable remote, which has all the good buttons. Have you noticed? Here's another thing, Brian Last. They're making all the remotes these days with fewer buttons. I want more buttons. Because inevitably on these little bitty tiny remotes with four fucking buttons, there's a function that you want to functuate that won't function because you ain't got a button for it. Has that happened to you? I'm pretty comfortable with my remotes, but what I was going to say is... Yeah, well, shove your remotes up your ass Well, then. thank you very much. You've had this problem ordering the pay-per-views, and now I'm smiling because of your comment here, but I have had also a problem last time. I had a problem ordering the pay-per-view. I'm going to do Bleacher Report again. Last time was the first time I tried to do regular pay-per-view, and it didn't work. They've had really good pay-per-view numbers. It's like the one thing you could always point to and say, hey, they're doing this. Makes me wonder if there are a lot of people who are having these issues. People who are not going to go, an older fan, who are not going to go to a Bleacher Report who tried to order it on pay-per-view, couldn't get it, and gave up. If we're both having this issue, how many other people are having it? Yeah, but Andy, and you know how all this shit works. You still couldn't order it, right? Right. I tried to order it through the TV, through Xfinity, and I had no luck. I had to go through Bleacher Report. Well, I would assume that, again, we're not alone, <laughs> that other people are having the same, if we're having it, the other people are, and, and we have to watch this shit to talk about it for our business. Other people are actually spending money with no return, just the enjoyment of watching these things, and they still have trouble getting them. That's what put Ring of Honor out of the internet pay-per-view business 10 years ago. Because those fuckers that go fight live, people got tired of, of going through the trouble. Even if they didn't get charged, they looked forward to it. They went to the trouble. Then they had the aggravation of sitting there trying to watch a black screen or a shitty signal or whatever. And they just gave up. And, you know, this is not widespread, I guess. Most of this streaming shit works for people who like that kind of thing. But... <laughs> If you're trying to order a pay-per-view for 50 fucking dollars and you and you still can't, somebody needs to tighten that shit up. 